As we begin with verse 25 of Romans chapter 11, it's quite clear that Paul has a troubling concern on his mind. It is that Gentiles may misunderstand, maybe even exaggerate their place in the kingdom of God because of their faith in Christ. It's always been so, beginning with Abraham, that Gentiles were invited to worship Israel's God and to place themselves under the covenants that Jehovah made with Israel. However, until the advent of Christ, it was assumed by all Hebrews, even Gentiles, that a true conversion was needed for a Gentile to join Israel. In ancient times, especially, gods were identified to specific nations. This was, there was usually one particular god that was considered as the founding god of a nation. And the relationship between any particular god and his nation was so intertwined that it was not unusual to call a nation by its national name and alternatively by the name of its founding god. The nation of Assyria is a, is a good example of this, as is prominent in the Bible. Assyria's founding god is Asher. Thus, in the Old Testament, it is common for it to refer at times to Assyria as Asher. So if a person from another nation wishes to worship the god of Assyria, Asher, then it was just assumed that that person would become a national Assyrian. Otherwise, their thought process was, well, what could possibly be the point of being part of one nation but worshiping the founding god of an entirely different nation? No benefit could come from that kind of a devotion. The people of Israel, of course, viewed such a, a prospect the same way. Therefore, since Jehovah was the founding God of Israel, it made no sense for a person of another nation, a Gentile, to worship the Hebrew God, the God of Israel, as their God. So if for whatever reason a Gentile decided to devote, to devote himself to Jehovah, then it was self-evident that this Gentile should convert and become an Israelite. In Christ's day, a Jew. Both sides believed in this protocol as, as, as a given. Now, it's important to understand that this was human thought. This was human custom that was being observed. It wasn't God's way. Yet God seemed to permit this misperception to continue among mankind, even among his own people, until the right moment in history arrived when it was time to take his people back to school. That moment was the advent of Messiah Yeshua. It was Paul whom Yeshua elected as the schoolmaster. His job was to teach Jew and Gentile that national, nationality, ethnicity, race, gender, these were irrelevant when it came to worshiping the true God and to attaining eternal life. It was especially the case when it came to trusting in the Jewish Messiah, whom God sent to deliver humankind from their sins. Now, as is easy to imagine, Gentiles, the outsiders, so to speak, were more receptive to such a notion of inclusion without conversion than the Jews who were the insiders. Now this set then the Jewish Paul against most of his brethren as he fought against requiring Gentiles to be circumcised in order to follow Yeshua since circumcision was the official rite of passage for a Gentile to convert and become a national Jew. Now, because as humans, it can be very hard for us to view most anything 
through other than the lens of our own interests and experiences, Paul's defense of Gentiles gaining eternal life and forgiveness of sins through Israel's Messiah, but without conversion, was seen as a combination of theological heresy and a kind of national treason by the Jews. Gentiles, on the other hand, apparently often saw it as God's favor being withdrawn from Israel in order to be placed upon Gentiles. What did some Gentiles conclude from this? Well, Gentiles must be better than Jews in some ways. Otherwise, why would the God of the Jews start including Gentiles? Paul seemed to believe this attitude of Gentiles was not only present in the city of Rome, the intended audience of his letter to the Romans, it also portended bad things for the body of Christ in general as the influx of general, uh, Gentiles to the faith just continued to grow. So throughout the book of Romans, Paul has been building a case to explain to the Jews why Gentiles belong. And to tell Gentiles not to get too big-headed about it. Hoping that gets him kind of ahead of the curve as to what he sees as a looming problem. Open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. We're going to read from verse 25 to the end. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's on page 1415. 1415. Starting at verse 25, Romans chapter 11. For brothers, I want you to understand this truth, which God formerly concealed but is now revealed, so that you won't imagine you know more than you actually do. It is that stoniness to a degree has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters its fullness, and that it is in this way that all Israel will be saved. As the Tanakh says, out of Zion will come the Redeemer. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, with respect to the good news, they are hated for your sake. But with respect to being chosen, they are loved for the patriarch's sake. For God's free gifts and his calling are irrevocable. Just as you yourselves were disobedient to God before, but have received mercy now because of Israel's disobedience... So also Israel has been disobedient now, so that by your showing them the same mercy that God has shown to you, they too may now receive God's mercy. For God has shut up all mankind together in disobedience in order that he might show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments, how unsearchable are his ways. For who has known the mind of Adonai, who's been his counselor? Or who has given him anything and made him pay it back? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, I've digressed from time to time to describe how the early church fathers perceived what Paul was trying to explain in his letters and how it is to be taken especially by Gentile Christians. Now, little could be more important to the fundamental doctrines that drive Christianity today than what the early church fathers decided. But as I've shown you in previous lessons, they shared no universal viewpoint on much of anything, especially through perhaps the 5th century AD. Nonetheless, what we do find is a trend from the earliest of the church fathers, little before 100 AD, to the later ones, up to, say, the late 700s AD, to embrace the very thing that Paul warned against here in Romans 11. That is, the church fathers 
eventually saw faith in Yeshua as not only an exclusively Gentile faith, but also as something that the Jews were unworthy of participating in. Even in the earlier times, there was disagreement among the church fathers of just who ought to be granted membership into Christianity. And much of that was based on the place of the law of Moses in the life of a believer. Naturally, the more Gentile in nature that a church father saw the church, the more he pushed against the law of Moses. A good example would be that of Genadius of Constantinople. He lived in the mid-400s AD. In his entry into the Pauline commentary of the Greek church, he said this, the Apostle Paul expressed himself in this way because he wants to show that law and grace are completely incompatible and that the two of them can never go together. Of necessity, one must drive the other one out. So here we have essentially a declaration of war from the church father, Genadius, sending Christianity against the law of Moses, and thus having the effect, of course, of setting Gentiles against Jews. Another indifferent church father, Augustine, who lived just a couple of decades before Genadius, had an entirely different viewpoint. In his homily called The Spirit and the Letter, Augustine said this, Grace is given not because we have done good works, but in order that we may have the power to do them. Not because we have fulfilled the law, but in order that we may be able to fulfill it. So, Augustine agrees with Paul and with Christ that the purpose of salvation through grace is so that we can be properly devoted to God's commandments and by means of the Holy Spirit enabled to do those laws in the spirit God intended. Now clearly, this was an inviting message to the Jewish people, not one that pitted Gentile against Jew or elevated Gentile above Jew by dismissing the law of Moses as an enemy of Christianity. Therefore, it, it is with a breath of fresh air that we read of yet another church father, Pelagius, who although championing some doctrines that we today would find mostly heretical, nonetheless says in his commentary on the book of Romans, specifically regarding, as a matter of fact, Romans 11 verse 25, all that follows is designed to prevent the Gentiles from being filled with pride towards the Jews. It is a secret unknown to mankind why the Gentiles were saved. Because Israel's blindness, in fact, furnished the occasion for their salvation. The blindness continued until the Jews saw that the Gentiles were being saved, since all were called to salvation. So, what we find is that by the early 400s AD, there was a growing schism within the church as to the place of the law of Moses and even as to the place of the Jews. It is rather ironic that in his era, Paul seeks to somehow try to fit Gentiles into their proper role within this religion of the Jews that he that, that, that believes upon Yeshua of Nazareth as their Messiah. But within three more centuries, the church had many leaders who were not sure if this was even possible or even desirable to try to fit Jews into Christianity. Within a few more centuries after that, the predominant view of the church leadership was that Jews not only had no place within the body of Christ as worshipers of Yeshua, but also they really had no place on this earth 
living in the same locations where Christians might reside. Though Paul was not a prophet, in the same sense as Isaiah or Ezekiel or even John, he indeed saw the future truly based on what he saw starting to happen in his day. Now, by beginning, by beginning verse 25, employing the word for, the idea is that Paul is going to give his readers the reasoning for his olive tree analogy, which we studied last time. Now, here he uses the term brothers. Notice, brothers, not brethren. Brothers is meant to indicate fellow believers, Jew or Gentile. The complete Jewish Bible uses a dynamic translation of this verse because it revolves around the Greek word mysterion that is usually translated into English as mystery. And as Dr. David Stern, the creator of the complete Jewish Bible, explains it, he does this because the English word mystery, as it's used in modern times, means something a little different than what the Greek mysterion is meant to impart 2,000 years ago. It does not mean mystery in the sense of a riddle. It also does not mean mystery in the pagan religious sense that is expressed in the term mystery Babylon religions. Rather, says Dr. Stern, it means it more as a truth that God holds intimately secret unto himself, which, at the proper moment, he will reveal it. The Lord has chosen Paul to be the messenger of this particular secret truth. And that secret truth is this. By all human logic, even from a human fairness standpoint, one would reckon that the entire nation of the Jews, well, they would be the first ones to be saved because of Christ. I mean, after all, they were given God's word. They produced both mediators that God would ever give us, Moses and then Yeshua. And the Jews were the first to hear the gospel, the first to be given the Holy Spirit, and it was especially aimed at them. Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the good news, since it is God's powerful means of bringing salvation to everyone who keeps on trusting, to the Jew especially, but equally to the Gentile. Still aiming his words at mostly Gentile believers, Paul explains why God is revealing now this mysterion, this truth that had been concealed, but now it's going to be revealed. Why he's doing it at this time, and it's this reason, Paul says, I'm doing this, God is doing this, so that you won't imagine you know more than you actually do. That is, so that Gentiles do not misunderstand God's purpose and motive for including them in his salvation plan at, his, at this time, Paul's going to explain the situation. And what is the reason, then, that God has for including Gentiles? Romans 11, 25 and 26. For brothers, I want you to understand this truth which God formerly concealed but has now revealed so that you won't imagine you know more than you actually do. It is that stoniness to a degree has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters its fullness. And it's in this way that all Israel will be saved. Paul reveals the three elements that make up this amazing truth that has remained hidden for thousands of years. First, it is that part of Israel has become hardened. The words the, that stoniness has come upon Israel, puts the onus on God. 
not on the people as the source of that hardening. But on the other hand, God hardened those particular Israelites, those Jews, because they had freely chosen not to accept Yeshua as their Messiah. The stone-like hardness of mind against Yeshua is, however, not total. Since the moment Christ revealed Himself, there have always been Jews who believed. So the hardening is a divine hardening, and not all of Israel has been affected by it, but the largest part has. Yet there is a remnant that was not hardened, and that remnant is the many thousands of Jewish believers in Yeshua. Now, the second element is that this hardening is going to remain in place until the Gentile world enters its fullness. Now, the Greek word that's being translated as fullness in this case is pleruma, pleruma. And it indicates, usually, the wholeness or the completeness of something. It comes from the exact same root as the Greek word pleiru, pleiru, pleiruma. Right? Now, why is this important? Because it is also one of the key words of Matthew 5, 17 through 19, when Christ says, don't think I've come to abolish the Torah of the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to complete. I've come to pleiru. The English word complete in the Greek is pleiru, and it means to fill to the fullest. It means to bring something to its full wholeness. I hope you see how this relates. Christ came to bring the law to a complete wholeness in the same way that God intends on bringing Gentiles to a complete wholeness. Now, obviously, this does not mean to terminate, right? unless God's goal is to terminate the Gentiles as well as the law. But what exactly does entering their fullness mean, then, as it concerns Gentiles? It means that when God determines that the Gentile world has been evangelized fully enough, and Gentile human beings have been given sufficient opportunity to make a decision for or against Christ, then the Gentiles have entered their fullness, their wholeness, their completeness. There are no more that will be saved, at least under the current circumstances. It is upon that determination that God will begin to supernaturally remove that stoniness of heart that non-believing Jews have. Now, the third element is that the purpose of elements one and two are to bring about the third element. And that third element is to save all Israel. Now, this path to a saving righteousness for all Israel that seems so convoluted, I mean, let's face it, it begins with the Jews, then it includes the Gentiles, then it goes back to the Jews, is in fact the path that God has determined. So what does all Israel mean? Does it mean every last Israelite? I think it has a meaning on two levels. The first level is that throughout the Bible, the term all Israel is synonymous with the whole house of Israel. And the whole house of Israel is referring to the fact that Israel has always been a divided family. Historically, it is represented by two socio-political factions. A group of tribes led by Judah, a second group of tribes led by Ephraim. The Bible refers to these two groups of tribes as the two houses of Israel, the house of Judah, the house of Ephraim, together the whole house of Israel. The house of Judah is what is known today as Jews. 
The house of Ephraim is known better to most Christians as the ten lost tribes. What Paul is revealing to us is the how of what the prophet Ezekiel reveals in his famous prophecy of the two sticks in Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but here is the final part of that chapter so that we can see the relationship between this mystery that Paul is revealing and the same mystery that Ezekiel is revealing, but much less of it, hundreds of years earlier. In Ezekiel chapter 37, I'm going to read from verses 15 through 28. The word of Adonai came to me. You, human being, take one stick and write on it for Judah and those joined with him among the people of Israel. Next, take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel who are joined to him. And finally, bring them together into a single stick so that they become one in your hand. And when your people ask you what all of this means, tell them that Adonai Elohim says this, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, together with the tribes of Israel who are joined with him, and put them together with the stick of Judah and make them a single stick so that they become one in my hand. The sticks on which you, are, on which you write are to be in your hand as they watch. And then say to them that Adonai Elohim says, I will take the people of Israel from among the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from every side and bring them back to their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. And one king will be their king for all of them. They will no longer be two nations. They will never again be divided into two kingdoms. They will never again defile themselves with their idols, their detestable things, any of their transgressions, but I will save them from all the places where they've been living and sinning. I will cleanse them so that they will be my people and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them and all of them will have one shepherd and they will live by my rulings, and they will keep and observe my regulations. They will live in the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, where your ancestors lived. They will live there, they, their children, their grandchildren, forever. And David, my servant, will be their leader forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant. I will give to them, increase their numbers. I will set my sanctuary among them forever. My home will be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. The nations will know that I'm Adonai, who sets Israel apart as holy when my sanctuary is with them forever. So my point is that since Paul is applying what he says to all Israel, then all Israel has to mean, at the least, both houses of Israel. But that can't happen until the two houses are rejoined. All that happens either after or coincidentally with the time when the fullness of the Gentiles has been reached, we read about in Ezekiel 37. We read about the reuniting of these two houses. We read about the end of their ungodliness. We read about, we're told, of their being ruled by who? David. Forever, it says. Now, David is referring to the Messiah from the family of David. David's been dead for 300 years by the time of Jeremiah, so obviously he meant the royal descendants of David, not David himself. And no mortal kings rule forever, but Yeshua will. So it is clear 
who Ezekiel is referring to as the forever ruler of an undivided Israel. It's Messiah Yeshua. It's Jesus Christ. And it so happens that the two houses of Israel are in the process of reuniting as we speak. Thousands of members of the ten lost tribes are returning. And they're reuniting with their brother tribe, Judah, the Jews, in the Holy Land. And I have personally witnessed it. Most mission organizations will confess that for all practical purposes, our entire planet has had the Word of God sent out to it. Not 100.00%. But I don't think 100.00% is the actual requirement. That is that every last living Gentile personally hears the gospel before the prophesied fullness of the Gentiles has been reached. The Bible simply doesn't deal by those kinds of standards. But I spoke of all Israel as also having a meaning on another level, a second level. Now, for sure it means what I just explained to you. But what it also likely means is similar to what fullness of the Gentiles means. That is, all Israel means the full number of Jews, Hebrews really, who will ever believe has been attained according to God's calculation. But the bottom line is this. All Israel will not be saved until God determines, the, determines that the fullness of the Gentiles has occurred first. And as the proof text for what he's asserting, in verses 26 and 27, Paul combines two passages from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21, and Isaiah 27, verse 9. For the sake of time, we're not going to go into these passages in Isaiah and read the full context. However, the gist of it is that these are dealing with the end of days. So the idea is that God is intervening in Israel's affairs at the end of days. And he is taking away sin from Jacob, from Israel. Paul is saying that these scriptures are speaking of, a, of that particular time when this divine hardening of Israel comes to an end, as Israel finally accepts their Redeemer, their Messiah. But this only happens as the end of days has begun. Now, verse 28 continues with the theme that is being directed towards Gentile believers. And Paul says that as regards the gospel, the only reason that God has acted as he has towards Israel, hardening them, is for the sake of the Gentiles. But at the same time, Israel remains loved by God for the sake of the Hebrew patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So Israel hasn't necessarily merited the hardening any more than they have merited the love. Thus, Gentiles shouldn't look at Jews and think their hardening is a divine punishment any more than that their election and the love God gives them is a reward. Israel is but a tool for redemption. It is a tool that can be used by the divine craftsman a number of different ways to achieve his purpose. Then we hit another one of those verses that just makes me want to slap my forehead and wonder how in the world so many can get it wrong when the words are so precise and clear. Paul says that God's gifts and his calling are irrevocable. Now, some abduct this phrase and use it to back the case for a once saved, always saved doctrine. But this verse has nothing to do with Christians at all. 
The subject is Israel. They were hated for the Gentiles' sake and loved for the patriarch's sake. So the permanence of Israel's calling as God's chosen people is the context for those words. However, as many of you are probably aware, a goodly portion of the church has determined that in the New Testament, wherever we find the word Israel as regards redemption and election, we should just kind of strike it out and replace it with the word church. Yet Paul says that such a calling of Israel cannot be revoked, it cannot be canceled, or as some Christians think, it can't be reassigned to somebody else. Israel is and will always be God's elect. Their unfaithfulness, their sinning does not affect that position. Even though by human standards and reasoning, we might think it, it should. But what does Paul mean then by it is for the sake of the patriarchs that God continues to love Israel? What's the patriarchs' sake? Here it is. They were the receivers of God's precious covenants, His promises. Those promises are contained in a very particular covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. So what is really being said is that Israel is loved by God without any chance of revocation for the sake of the covenant He made with the patriarchs. It is that covenant relationship that, with Israel that is not cancelable for any reason. So in verse 30, Paul then makes a comparison between Israel and Gentiles. The purpose is to make clear the equality in God's eyes between Jews and Gentiles, and then to highlight once again that Gentiles should understand that it is nothing that they did that has caused God to offer them salvation, rather, simply because of His great mercy. But even more, Gentiles were disobedient. Paul spent the first few chapters of Romans speaking of Gentiles in terms of natural law, and that humans have written within our inner parts certain premises for our behavior and our morality. All humans possess it. Thus, the fact that Gentiles didn't have the law of Moses to go by doesn't change anything. Breaking the natural law is no different as pertains to sin than breaking the law of Moses. It's still disobedience. And the result of this disobedience is also the same then. For those who have the natural law, Gentiles, as for those who have the law of Moses, the Jews, and that is the eternal death sentence. Therefore, Gentiles are in equal need of God's mercy as are Jews. And yet, Paul cautions, the mercy that Gentiles have received was only because of Israel's disobedience and then God's reaction to it. Therefore, says Paul, it is the duty of Gentiles to show these disobedient Jews mercy. Because by showing Jews that same mercy, that God showed to the Gentiles, then the Jews can also receive God's mercy. And what is God's mercy? Salvation through trust in Yeshua. I'll bet you've never thought about your salvation in those terms, have you? Let's break this down. The disobedient Jews were hardened by God. This enabled God to turn to the Gentiles and offer them mercy, the salvation that Israel as a whole turned down. But now Gentiles, understanding that our job is to make Israel jealous for the same salvation that we have through their Messiah, 
is to accomplish this by showing such godly love to them that they just can't resist. And by believing Gentiles, showing the Jewish people such tender love and mercy, it will make them open up to accepting the saving mercy that Yeshua gives us. That same mercy. This reaction of Jews to believing Gentiles, listen to me, is guaranteed. It's not a maybe. It's guaranteed. But shoving a Christian tract into a Jew's hands on a street corner? Laying an English New Testament on the front porch of an ultra-Orthodox Jew? That is not showing them God's mercy. All it does is offend and harden them all the more. So what does show love and mercy to the Jewish people? What is the actual application of this duty of Gentile believers to show love and mercy to Jews? By way of example, I suppose this makes me want to boast a little bit about a seed of Abraham ministries. Because while we teach this and other godly principles, we also obey God's command to show love and mercy to the Jewish people. We have a non-profit retail store that imports goods made by industrious Jews in Israel, and we sell those goods in America online to help Jewish families make a living. We have a humanitarian ministry in Jerusalem run entirely by Messianic Jews that helps Israelis in need, provides scholarships to college and, and, and vocational schools for Israeli youth, helps the young soldiers of the IDF with clothing and other items the army can't provide them. We operate a sizable youth ministry there to mentor the young believing Jewish adults in their walk with Yeshua. We have another and different ministry in the Mediterranean port city of Ashdod. It's a teaching ministry that teaches the Holy Scriptures, including the New Testament, in the Hebrew language to the local Jews. Then we disciple those who have shown an interest in Yeshua. We, of course, aren't the only ones taking literally God's commandment to show mercy to Jews in response to the saving righteousness that we have received from God on account of them. But folks, the Father's not offering us a suggestion that in our spare time, we might offer a little mercy to His people. If we so choose. We're feeling good about it today. I've often said that sadly enough, the evangelical church has made salvation itself the entire goal of being a Christian. Thus, once saved, we can retire, secure that we'll go to heaven when we die. Yet the Lord makes it clear we're saved for a purpose. We're saved for a purpose much larger than ourselves. And one of our great purposes, Paul just outlined for us, it's to help save all Israel. That it's not our only purpose, but it is the purpose that Jehovah says it's at the top of his list. That's the part of his list I want to work on, I think. Verse 32 essentially summarizes the focal point of Romans chapters 9 through 11. The twin themes of disobedience by all humans and God's mercy to all humans dominates all of Romans. Paul discussed this issue in regards to Gentiles quite explicitly back in Romans 1.18 through Romans 2.16. He then discussed it in regards to Jewish people in Romans 2.17 through Romans 3.20. Then he took it up again in chapters 5 and in chapter 7. And what Paul wants all people to understand is that God does not cause people to disobey. People disobey because we want to. You know, we don't usually sin out of ignorance. 
We don't sin because we don't want to. We sin because we enjoy it. We sin usually because in our selfishness we find it pleasurable or in some way beneficial to us. But when we do sin, we find ourselves imprisoned by God, having our advantages and our benefits divinely limited, and then we are subjected to consequences because God is just. Because disobedience towards Him cannot go unpunished. This is the condition that all humanity faces, not just Jews and not just Gentiles. Thus, in God's infinite wisdom, because all humanity sins and falls short of the glory of God, all humanity is imprisoned, or as Paul would say, is shut up in our disobedience. But then God uses this common condition among every last human being who has ever lived to make equally available to all humans his great mercy through a son, Yeshua. Now, perhaps you can think of a better way that you might have approached the problem of sin and eternal death if you were God. And in fact, literally billions of humans think they can. It doesn't matter. This is God's way. It's the only way that he's ever come up with, and it's the only way that's ever going to be offered to us. It is tragic. <clears throat> it's tragic that scoffers and mockers look at this way of the Lord and they laugh at it. They see Yeshua's followers as little more than children following a fantasy. They read about God's plan of redemption, and you know what they think? This is the most silly thing I've ever seen. This is so impractical. But Paul virtually breaks into song as he thinks about the mysterion, this hidden but now revealed truth that the Lord showed to him. About how God saves people from eternal annihilation. Verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how inscrutable are his judgments, how unsearchable are his ways. But you know, we can all say a big amen to that. But this is not the usual response from humans. Back in Romans chapter 1, Paul said this, for ever since the creation of the universe, his invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature, they have been clearly seen because they can be seen from what he's made. Therefore, they have no excuse because although they know who God is, they do not glorify him or, uh, as God or thank him. On the contrary, they have become futile in their thinking and their undiscerning hearts have become darkened, claiming to be wise, they have become fools. In verses 33 and 34, using passages from Isaiah chapter 40 and Job 41, Paul continues to extol the virtues and the character of our God from his supreme sovereignty to his unceasing faithfulness to the fact that not one thing that he promises will ever ever go undone, should we not be as overwhelmed as the Apostle Paul? So rightfully so, Paul ends this section with a blessing that is also a prayer of thanksgiving for God's great love and mercy towards all of mankind. He says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. We'll begin Roman chapter 12 next week.